Hi there, everybody. This is Sharon Epperson, CNBC Senior Personal Finance Correspondent, and I'm so excited to join all of you today for a very special Junior Achievement and CNBC Town Hall. This is about the students today, and we're excited to bring you something that I hope will be inspiring and informative for everyone as we go through this COVID-19 pandemic. You know, there it's affecting so many aspects of our lives. As a correspondent and also a mother of two teenagers, I know how difficult this has been for school routines, for figuring out what it's going to mean to our health, to jobs, to the economy, and to your futures. And so today we're here to answer some of your questions. We have a wonderful team of panelists to do this. And at CNBC, of course, this is what we do all the time. We have a special initiative, a financial education initiative called Invest in You, Ready, Set, Grow, that we're working on in partnership with the micro-investing app, Acorns. And we're talking about how to save, invest, manage your money, protect your money, particularly in these unprecedented times. We're proud today to sponsor with Junior Achievement this special town hall to give students across America direct access to some of these really stellar panel of experts. And over the next hour, they're going to be answering your questions. Right now, I'd like to bring in the person who came up with this terrific idea, and that is the president and CEO of Junior Achievement, Jack Kosakowski. And we're so proud to be doing this with you, Jack. Thanks so much for having all of us. Oh, thank you, Sharon. And thank you to CNBC, the global leader in business news, for partnering with Junior Achievement to make this virtual town hall possible. You know, a lot has happened in a really short period of time and the uncertainty that comes with that can be scary. You're probably seeing a lot in social media and in the news about the stock market, about businesses closing and people losing their jobs. And I'm sure many of you are experiencing those events in your own lives and it's raised a lot of questions. Our hope for today's town hall meeting is that you'll feel comfortable to share your concerns and ask questions and our panel will do their very best to address them. The one thing I can share with you for certain is that this global pandemic will not last forever. Things are going to eventually get better. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. And we're also all in this together. And today we're together with some really stellar experts who's going to talk to us and answer some of your questions. I wanted to meet the rest of the panel right now and thank them again for taking the time to be with us today. Sheila Baer is the former chair of the FDIC. She's widely respected for her expertise in financial regulation and consumer protection, and she's an advocate for financial system stability and responsible lending practices. She's also a member of our CNBC Financial Wellness Council. So Sheila, thank you very much for joining us. Brian Coleman was the 2019 National School Counselor of the Year, and he is a counseling department chair at Williams Jones College Prep High School and comes to us from Chicago today. Dr. Brad Klontz is a financial psychologist and a certified financial planner. He's also a member of the CNBC Financial Wellness Council. And we have a celebrity in our virtual house today. We really want to thank Damon John for joining us. You, of course, know him as one of the co-stars of Shark Tank. He's the founder and CEO of FUBU and the best-selling author of Rise and Grind, The Power of Broke, and Power Shift. But today, the celebrities are also all of you the students across America who are listening and are watching this town hall. We want to get started now with some of you from middle and high school students from JA chapters all over the country. You've sent in questions ahead of this event and they're very thoughtful, very insightful and a testament to the work that JA is doing across the country. And one of the first questions that we want to address at CNBC, of course, we talk about the markets and the economy all the time. And a lot of you had questions about how this pandemic is actually affecting our economy. Sheila, we have 18-year-old Camille Lawler from Hoover, Alabama. She's getting ready to graduate and has a question about her generation's future. Camille? Great. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm so excited to be a part of this tremendous opportunity. And I hope everyone's doing well during this time. Um, so in light of recent events with the global pandemic, I want to know what, if any, financial responsibilities will my generation have in the future to help stimulate the economy? Well, you know, Camille, that was a really 
nice question. And I particularly like the fact that you talked about responsibilities because we all have a responsibility uh, to contribute to our economy, to contribute to our society. But my generation in particular has a responsibility to not push off problems on younger generations like yours. And I do think this is a real issue. Um, we rely as a society and economy on just too much debt. Uh, there was a lot of borrowing uh, going on before uh, this terrible crisis. Household debt was at consumer debt was at historic highs, business debt, and of course, government debt. We were already running trillion dollar deficits going into this, and now the deficit this year is likely to go to four trillion dollars because of all the spending that we need to do to mute the terrible economic damage being caused by the by the pandemic. So I think that probably has to be done. I regret that we had so much debt going into this. It has made our economy less resilient, less capable of absorbing uh, the costs that we're experiencing now. But we will have to borrow a lot more money, our government, uh, to get through this. But once we get to the other side, we need to pull out. We need to return to sustainable financial practices because driving a government or an economy on debt just simply isn't sustainable. It's a way of pushing problems off to future generations, and that's just not not fair to you. So I, I really appreciate the question. You know, if you're particularly interested in, in fiscal uh, deficit issues and the impact of this on future generations, there's a group called the Peterson Foundation that is dedicated to looking at these issues in terms of their impact and burden on, on younger generations. And they have a group called Up to Us that's on 400 college campuses that might be something you want to consider if, if you're interested in getting more active. But thank you, it was a great question. Thanks, Thank you. Sheila. Damon, Damon, what would you say to Camille? Yeah, I mean, I, listen, um, I think that Sheila really hit it on the head. I mean, I think that we all have a responsibility and uh, we will have to pay it forward, but we cannot live in the way that we have been living. And uh, uh, the, it's always going to reset uh, no matter what. And who's going to pay that price for the reset? I mean, no matter what, the economy is always two steps forward, one step back. It looked like we went six steps forward. And when we go back, it's going to hurt. And uh, I'm, I'm really happy that Camille is thinking about the responsibilities uh, that her generation will take on. Yeah, absolutely. You know, a lot of people are adjusting to this new normal. And Dr. Brad Klontz, Nathan Russell, he's 16 years old from Wisconsin. He has a question about consumers and their habits during COVID-19. Nathan? Hi, yes. So I hope all of you guys are doing good. Um, in my hometown of Menominee Falls, I teach junior achievement classes to elementary school students. Our first lesson is about wants and needs. And so my question to you guys is, do you think that people are going to want more or need less after experiencing this crisis? Nathan, fabulous question. And, you know, this is the first crisis we've experienced as a country, as a species, and there's going to be more of these that come. And in any crisis, it, it's a critical to have this mindset where is the opportunity? Where is the opportunity? So this is the question that I keep asking myself. I encourage you to be asking yourself anytime you hit a rough patch like this. Um, and this financial stress really can be a wake up call. You know, as Sheila said, you know, the average, well, she was talking about our, us as a culture, but the average American was in terrible financial shape leading up to this crisis, very bad financial shape at a time when our country was supposedly doing the best it had ever done. And so really it comes down to our personal finance. Um, and as you said, very critical. I think a lot of us are actually looking at it right in the face. What is the difference between a need and a want? Um, and many of us are reducing our spending, focusing on values, uh, because really ultimately too, stuff, buying things, it doesn't really lead to sustained happiness at all. I mean, it gives you like a momentary boost. How do you spend your time? And so this is one of the opportunities I think a crisis like this is giving many of us how do we spend our time in ways that are fulfilling, that do lead to happiness? But in the end, I think that we will see less spending on the other side of this. Yeah, Brian, you know, so few schools, high schools or middle schools teach financial literacy, talk about personal finance in the school curriculum. And now it's a time that families are going through so much turmoil that it's critical that everyone talks about it, that families talk about it, students and their parents um, and their extended family members. What would you say? What are your thoughts on this for, for Nathan? Yeah, I think it's so important that we consider you know, talking about wants and needs. Um, coming out of this, some individuals and families may feel they want more material things, um, but I think for so many of us, we're going to need more social-emotional 
connected, some, some intangibles that really help us to cope with the trauma that we are experiencing. I think on a very real level, there is a shared trauma that we are experiencing through the global pandemic and coming out the other side of this. I think we're all going to need to take a, a more informed, empathetic approach to supporting one another and thinking about our emotional needs and our holistic wellness just as much as our material needs. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Sheila, you've spent your career in finance, in government. Um, Krish Desai is a 17-year-old from East Brunswick High School. He has a question about the Fed. Krish? Hey, everyone. Glad to be here. Um, hope you guys are all doing well. So, you know, during the beginning of this crisis, the Fed enacted an emergency rate plan. My question is, why did that rate plan have the positive effects that, you know, we expected it to have? Sheila, did you get that about why the Fed rate cut really had an impact? Let me try to talk. There we go. Perfect. So that was such a good question. That is really an astute question. And a lot of uh, people and very sophisticated people in the financial markets are asking that. The lowering interest rates has had a positive impact. It may not be readily apparent, but for one thing, it's letting our government issue a lot of debt very cheaply to pay for all this stimulus and the Fed's basically buying that debt. So there's going to be an unlimited supply of, of debt to issue that hopefully our government will not abuse. So that has helped. It's also helped for larger companies, larger employers that uh, they typically rely on corporate debt markets, which had frozen up. So when the Fed reduced rates and took these other measures, those, those markets opened up. So larger employers were able to access funding now uh, that they were not able to access before. But the, the impact has not been, uh, has, has been somewhat muted. And I think this just suggests that this endless cycle we have of every time we get into these problems, we ask the Fed to lower interest rates and get everybody to borrow more money and spend more money on things you may not need to stimulate the economy. We have got to get off this carousel and it's spent as a strategy. It's just not working anymore. So that is a really good question. And I think, you know, hopefully, your generation will help us right this ship and get off this debt carousel and, and low interest rates. Start start rewarding some savings instead and and be uh, less reliant on debt debt infused uh, consumption. Really good question. Yeah, Sheila, I agree. Chris, we're, we're relying on all of you to help through this process and and right this ship, as as Sheila said. Brian, um, Macy Harden is 13 years old and she's from Iowa. She's a student at St. Francis Assisi. She is learning from home like everyone else working from home as well. And she has a question about this new digital landscape. Macy? Macy, are you with us? We seem to have lost Macy. OK, I'm going to ask her a question because it's a really, really good one. Um, she's in the seventh grade. She's doing school online, she says, and it's a very new experience for her, as it is for all of many of the students who are doing distance learning right now. And she wants to know whether the pandemic is going to permanently change the way that we do business as well as the way education operates in this country. What do you think, Brian? You know what, Macy? I hope we get you back so I can talk well, to you because that right. is really Great question. Um, you're asking a question that I've been asking myself and I've been asking a lot of my peers in education. I mean that I'm currently at home speaking to everyone uh, from my couch is bizarre, right? Um, I'm wearing a cardigan and my pajamas, okay? Uh, I think it's so interesting when we think about the future of education because things like uh, communication, how do we communicate, how do we connect, my role, I'm a school counselor. My work is all about relationships. I feel like education is so steeped in relationship work. Well, how do we do that remotely? Um, the implications of technology and technology access, we've seen very, very quickly um, across the country that there are a lot of issues when it comes to getting students and families access to technology or in a household, is there one device that all of the family members are sharing or is there consistent wireless internet access? There are all of these obstacles to be considered as we think about how to do education remotely that requires so much technology um, and an awareness and education around the importance of technology in this time. And then I think about things like the actual process of 
of learning, learning new skills, skill acquisition, and grading. And how do we grade uh, under these circumstances in this new climate? I do think wholeheartedly there are going to be some significant shifts, and that we're already starting to see that. This this lovely opportunity today with all of you uh, is one of the positives, right? And I want to continue to look at ways in which we can work together to come up with some practical uh, solutions to support this transition, knowing that it will absolutely be a transition for us all. Macy, are you back with us? Yes, I am. Do you have a follow-up question for Brian? Um, do you think that education will start going online because of this? Interesting question. I think that um, we will use online resources more. I think that it may take some time before we can all be together in an education space in the way that we were. Um, and that in the interim, I think online education or hybrid models of education uh, will be uh, used more frequently. I do have a question for you. Uh, what do you make of the digital landscape and how's it been for you to learn in this climate? Well, I've been doing really well with the online learning. I'm getting used to it and I have four siblings. So every day is interesting and something exciting is always happening. So well, good luck to you. And that's a wonderful question. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Thanks, Macy. We're all having to adjust to the way to do this. And one of the groups that has has to adjust and has had a very difficult time have been small businesses. And Damon, I wanted to ask you, you know, businesses with fewer than 500 employees account for about 43 percent of the GDP, about 48 percent of American jobs. And Rhea Vora is graduating from Middlesex County Academy. She's heading to Cornell in the fall. Congratulations to you, Rhea. And she has a question about what this disruption on small businesses, what the impact is going to be. Rhea? Yes. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Something that I've noticed is that there are a lot of small businesses in my area. So my question to you is, how do you think the COVID-19 virus is going to affect these small businesses, both in the short term, but also in the years to come? Uh, that's a really excellent question, Rhea. Um, and to elaborate on small businesses, out of the approximately 30 million small businesses, 21 or 22 million of them are one man or woman owned uh, businesses. So it all depends, you know, there's not one answer for it. Many will, unfortunately, uh, you know, they will suffer because a small business is almost like an everyday person. Sometimes they're living check to check themselves. However, others will be able to pivot. And the beauty of having a small business is a lot of times you're agile and you'll be able to pivot. You'll be able to take that business online uh, and a lot of new small businesses will come out. A kid came to my, uh, my house the other day and said, I opened up a new small business. I have a drone and what I'm going to do is drone all the homes in the neighborhood and I'm going to go to the real estate. Uh, the, re, uh, the real estate place over there and show them the listings of all the homes that people can now post online in the event that they want to sell their home. So uh, the small uh, the small businesses in the immediate future will have to be agile and some will fall by the wayside. And usually a successful small business is probably the person's third or fourth business. They closed it down several times earlier because they may not have had everything correct. And when they reopened another business, they learned from what they learned in the past. In the long run, small businesses are going to do great. They're going to learn how to be more virtual. They're going to learn how to be more agile and they're going to learn how to be maybe more technically proficient because the great students like you who are going to come into the business and say, this is how you can communicate around the world with your iPhone. And you no longer need a storefront. Yeah, Damon, you know, my 14 year old and 17 year old have helped me a lot in figuring out how to do my job from home. And I'm wondering for the students on the call, what should they know about even right now what they can do to help small businesses? Because a lot of them have skills that some small business owners don't have. So what do you think are some of the skills you'd be looking for? Small businesses would be looking for from young people today? That is an excellent question. And if 20 years ago you would have told a, a person that I am a digital marketer or I'm a pay per click person or I'm a social media person or a content provider, they would look at you like you're crazy. But as the, the amazing future that we have right in front of us, the kids, they grew up as digital natives. And there are a lot of small businesses right now with inventory that they can't move because foot traffic's not coming by. 
you can easily work with them and say, hey, can I help market and or get your goods out and make a small percentage? You would basically help yourself and you would help the business move goods and you would show them. So mentorship can always also be reverse mentorship. The mentor does not, not necessarily have to be older, right? So you can have a symbiotic relationship and help people because maybe a month ago they wouldn't listen to you. Now they're like, maybe you have some good ideas that I can do <laughs> because we're all trying to figure it out. That sounds good, right, Ria? Yes, thank you so much. Yes, thank you, thank you. Um, I wanna move on to Sheila because Layla Khan, who's a senior at Scottsdale Prep in Arizona, she volunteers her time tutoring sir, tutoring to refugee children. And she's heading to MIT in the fall and she's curious about what all of these recession risks are going to mean to so many people. Layla? Hi, thank you so much for having me. I hope you all are doing well during this time. In light of fear surrounding the consequences of a bear market, the question I have for you is, what economic measures should the United States government take to prevent a deepening recession? Right. Well, I think it's, it's important to remember that the stock market is not the real economy. So it, those have kind of diverged for a while. So don't get too scared by the stock market going down or optimistic by it going up. I think there are other factors involved. But in terms of the real economy, uh, I think there are some short-term steps and there's some long-term steps. Um, in the short term, I think we need to do what we're doing, probably more of what we're doing now, getting cash assistance to households. There's been so, you know huge job losses, obviously, and reduced income, uh, small businesses closing. Getting cash assistance, not more debt, cash assistance to households, I think, is the right thing to do. Getting assistance to small businesses, real small businesses, those on Main Street, they've been hit the hardest by this but they're a huge uh, driver of, of job growth in our country. There are entrepreneurs that are the backbone of our economy, really. So focusing on, on helping them and giving them access to funds to keep, to keep their employees employed. I mean, that's really the whole focus of what's been called the PPP Act, the Small Business um, Assistance Act that Congress recently passed. And this is important because it, it, it somewhat shifts how we've approached recessions in the past. So in the past, we really focused on unemployment insurance and kind of letting people lose jobs and giving them unemployment insurance. Other countries like Germany have a different approach. They actually try to keep people employed and provide incentives for businesses to at least keep people on payroll. Maybe it's half time, the government comes in and helps subsidize that. So this small business program, it does that. So it provides a forgivable loan if these small businesses can keep their, their employees on, on payroll. So in the short term, I think those are hugely important. And then longer term, we just need to get smarter about how we drive our economy. I've talked a bit about debt already, but we need to get smart. If we're gonna have deficits for a while, we will. We need to be smarter about how we spend that money, make long-term investments in infrastructure, better education, you know, more responsive education to labor market needs, get away from student debt as the way to finance education. These are good uses, investing in our young people, investing in our infrastructure, to support uh, our economy and that will make it healthier and grow faster. You know, another area that people don't think of in terms of stimulus, but tax reform can actually have a good stimulative effect on the economy. Every time Congress puts in a loop roll or a special tax break, it's inefficient because it drives economic activity to take advantage of that tax break or loophole. And there's lots of research that shows you get rid of those, kind of flatten it out you can actually stimulate the economy that way and that doesn't cost any money. So there are a lot of things that I think short term and long term that our policy makers, our policy makers in Washington can do to, to mute the terrible impact of this. Good question. Really Thank good question. So Damon, I just want to know, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think uh, so Sheila, Sheila has a way bigger brain when it comes to <laughs> tax reform and things of that nature. You know, I make t-shirts for a living. Um, I think that she hit it all on the head and I actually wrote down a couple of notes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. I agree. I agree. Write down notes here on, on my, my end as well. <laughs> the bottom line is you always got to keep learning. I don't care yeah. what age or what level you're at. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Sheila, you made a good point about student loans as well. And Junior Achievement just came out with his survey. It's an excellent survey. And I urge you all to look at it because I want you to understand you're not alone. When you look at some of the issues that you're dealing with, there are 58% of teens in this country that are more likely to take out a student loan now because of this pandemic. And uh, Brian, you work with high school students every day. A lot of them are dealing with this college process now virtually. And I'd like 
Braxton Sims, who's a high school senior and he's heading to Auburn University in the fall, he has a question about student loans. And Braxton, what's your question? Yeah, so like you said, um, next year I'll be heading to Auburn University, where you go, by the way. And um, I was just wondering uh, how the current situation is going to affect the student loan process. Okay. Well, first, congratulations on Auburn. All right. Um, second, I'm going to kick it back to you. How do you think it might influence the loan process? I mean, I really don't know. I think uh, with a lot of families probably earning um, maybe less money this year, it's it's going to be possible that people are going to need more in uh, the student loans to like area. So uh, I was I was really just wondering how they would go about doing that, and um, you know, just overall how it's going to be affected. How are we going to have to? I guess you have to apply for student loans online and stuff too. Sure, I think the biggest piece, and it was uh, hit on a little bit earlier, is the importance of financial literacy. I think there's going to be a lot of anxiety around uh, the cost of attendance, the cost of education. I think it's very, very important that that education occur at the secondary level, at the high school level, um, that we're talking to our students and families about uh, the expenses that they may incur as they matriculate into college. And, you know, in my institution, we talk a lot about uh, net price calculator, making sure at the very least, uh, in addition to the anxiety that all of this brings up, do you have a working knowledge of how much this school or institution will cost you and your family? And so many uh, students and families just aren't aware that the college and universities in the U.S. have a net price calculator on all of their websites, the requirement, right? And just making sure that we're aware of what the needs are before we get to the point of, I need, I got to take on loans, right? We got to thinking about like, what does that mean to take on a loan? What, what does it mean to invest in your education in that way? You know, I think Sheila mentioned earlier, even before all of this, uh, families were taking on too much debt, right? And how can we think about, are there schools that will meet 100% of need? Do you understand the need that you have for the cost of attendance? So making sure in as much as we can, not only our schools, educating our students, but there are families having meaningful, uh, transparent conversations about the financial needs in the household and what is or is not possible. That needs to be happening in the household and in the schools. We need to do our part to make sure we're giving that education those resources as well. Dr. Klontz, I wanted to bring you in for this question too, because I think Braxton brings out a very good point and Brian really underscored that this is a family situation in many cases. It's not just the student alone. And there's a conversation, a very frank, a very humbling, and a very real conversation that families are going to have to have with one another, regardless if a decision has been made about what college to attend or not, there may be some changes ahead. Can you talk a little bit about how the student perhaps can uh, initiate this conversation or for the parents that are watching this as well, what do they need to do? Yeah, the, the whole landscape has changed. It's absolutely a different picture than it was a decade, two decades ago. When you look at what's happening with employment, when you look at how valuable a degree is to begin with, and it's it's it, totally a business decision right now. And to your point, it takes it takes a whole family to decide because the whole family is typically investing in that education. No, it's, the days are gone where you just go get a bachelor's degree and all of a sudden you make a bunch of money. You have you have to you have to research, um, you know, how much that profession makes post graduation, and then you have to shop around and find a school that fits within your budget to see whether or not going to one school or another school really makes a difference in terms of your income. And quite often it doesn't. You know, sometimes it does, but you have to analyze this with a business mindset now. Yeah, you know, uh, many students also are in that business mindset already because of course they're part of junior achievement and they've started their own small business. Damon Abigail Payton, she's a sophomore at Memorial High School in Houston and she has a question about what should she be doing now in terms of managing her own junior achievement small business. Abigail? Hi and thank you for having me and I hope everyone is doing well. So I am the head of supply chain and also acting head of sales for my JA company Bio2Go. And we faced several hardships due to COVID-19. But prior to the pandemic, our biodegradable food containers <laughs> were being Great. marketed towards small local restaurants. And due to lockdown and social distancing policies, our overall sales has been negatively impacted as we're now unable to market our products to the general public. What advice would you give to small student businesses like mine? Uh, well, yours, uh, you know, uh, you know, 
Thank you for the question. I think that everybody, as I was sharing earlier, needs to find a way to pivot. So, you know, you have to look at really the DNA of your uh, original customer. If it was a small business and were they more into uh, being socially conscious about what they were doing and how are you going to be able just to use that on another platform, meaning going online and, and uh, you know, and marketing to the food delivery services and various other people that are doing well. you got to find ways to collaborate. And usually when people collaborate, they find a like-minded customer that is that is acquiring a different type of product and they're basically saying okay well I just met somebody who had had a gym and all their members cannot come to the gym but they connected with a, a fresh juice uh, delivery company and said if you sell to my members give them 15% off give me 5% and you'll increase your membership your your membership for your juices my customer will feel there's a value and I'll make a couple of dollars, but they know where their customers are. And you just really need to try to find a way to find uh, the customer that you're looking for that shares the same sentiment and has the same objectives in life. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you for Thank your you. question. Um, Brian, I wanted to ask you as a school counselor, you know, I know you're very concerned about your students' well being um, at school, at home, and now at school home slash the same place. Um, many families uh, coming from a lower income are having a very difficult time adjusting to the whole virtual learning and distance learning as we've talked about. And Jabari Courtney is a senior in the Junior Achievement Program, the 3DE program at Benjamin Banneker High School in College Park, Georgia. He has a question for you specifically about financial resources. Hey guys, thank you for having me. Um, once again, I'm a senior at Banneker High School. Next uh, semester, I'll be attending Howard University. And my question for you is, what are ways for individuals with more financial resources to better help um, um, income? Help, uh, sorry. What are, um, uh, I'm so sorry, guys. What are ways for individuals with more financial resources to better help lower income families during this time? All right. That's a great question, Jabari. And you know what? Take your time. My yeah. screen might freeze at any given moment, and I will have to adjust and cope with that on the fly. So I appreciate your question, and we're all figuring it out. I think uh, the first thing that comes to mind for me is giving. Can you give um, in a meaningful way? Are there local charities that you can give to? Are there charities at the national level that you're passionate about? National Association of Free and Charitable Clinics, the UN Response Fund. Like, can you give in a meaningful way? Um, can you partner with local institutions in your area, with your schools? I know that many schools are raising funds for families and uh, for communities to help support them during this difficult time. I also think about ways that you can give that may not require fiscal giving. Um, can you give of your time? Can you give your story? I think it's been very powerful, especially in an age when social media is so uh, powerful and influential. Are we talking about what we are experiencing? Are we talking about what we're seeing? Are we talking about um, what the needs are in the communities and advocating um, for marginalized communities and for marginalized populations who may not have that voice, may not have that opportunity. So sharing our voice and uh, elevating the situations that require our attention as a community uh, locally, but also at the national level. Could, could I, Sharon, could I just- Yes, uh, please. So, just say how inspired I am by your question. Um, you probably have read that uh, others have had a different mindset, which is to exploit programs they don't really need uh, that are there for others like our small business program we've seen examples of large businesses that have strong balance sheets trying to use a, a small business program uh, i'm on the board of a, a company called fannie mae we're offering uh, modifications of for mortgages of forbearance for people who have mortgages who've been adversely impacted but we're also finding people calling in who, who still have their jobs and can pay their mortgage and, and, and using resources. So I think that's a small minority of people, I would say, but I just, I'm inspired by your willingness to want to give and not try to take in these times. So thank you. <laughs> I think there are a lot of social entrepreneurs that are on this call right now, Sheila. A lot of students that have ideas and have already worked on programs that um, are really giving back in a meaningful way. And I think one simple way that all of you can give back today is, you know, you're on social media all the time. Share what you've learned. If Damon John is taking notes, and we know that he is the consummate businessman, then you all are definitely taking notes as well, I'm sure. And so share a couple of the things that you've heard here today on social media and, and with your friends so that you, in that way, you are giving back in a very meaningful way and you're sharing with a lot more people than just the one or two people that you may talk to after this. You know, a lot more people will see it. So thank you again for your question. Um, and thank you, Sheila.
I wanted to ask you, um, Brian, if you could help out Hope. Hope um, Helminski, she attends Saranac Junior High School in Michigan. She's 18 years old. She has a, a question about opportunities for teens to earn money. Hope, what's your question? Hi, thank you so much for having me. This is a great opportunity and a huge honor. Many of the jobs that are typically occupied by teens are either gone or could have been taken by adults that lost their employment. What can teens do to market themselves as good candidates for these jobs? And do you anticipate any new jobs because of COVID-19 that teens could occupy? Wow. Ryan? <laughs> oh, no pressure. Oh, I appreciate it. Uh, wonderful, wonderful question. Um, what really comes to mind for me, and I think Damon mentioned this earlier, um, your, your digital natives in ways that generations before you uh, were not and are not, right? And I think when we talk about marketing yourself, I think it's very important that you come into the marketplace with a point of view of what do you have to give and what can you give that others cannot. And I think even before all of this occurred, talking to my students about, you know what, you could help anyone in your community uh, put together a website. You could help uh, explain social media and social media marketing uh, to individuals in your community in a way that you've done from an early age that others may still not understand, or the technology necessary to communicate, like video conferencing, et cetera. Um, you can tutor and share of your mind. You can create all sorts of businesses and innovative uh, opportunities for individuals in your community using your knowledge of technology um, and uh, computer literacy in ways that others may not. Um, I think more than anything, we still have to see what, uh, what, what opportunities are going to exist um, as we continue to see how global pandemic impacts our economy in the short term and the long term. But I what I think is most important for everyone thinking about going into the workforce, going into the marketplace, that you have a point of view and that you're aware of your transferable skills. Just because, for example, you uh, really want to uh, go into engineering, uh, it doesn't mean uh, necessarily that you have to come from an engineering background or have that exposure at the high school level. Just because you have a background in theater and arts uh, doesn't mean that you have to go into the arts. You could use your communication skills and your uh, personality and your marketing skills to go into a variety of fields. Go into broadcasting, go into journalism. There are all of these different options. We need uh, individuals that are innovative, that are forward thinking, thinking in the way that all of you are asking really powerful, important questions. Uh, we need those decision makers and thought leaders at the table, regardless of industry, and knowing that you have worth and value in all of those areas is very important. Brian, I have one question. I want to get um, some reaction from Damon as well, but I wanted to ask you if there's some concrete um, tools that teens should be using now. If you're in high school, is it too early to get a LinkedIn profile? Should you be working on a resume? What are some of the specific tools that um, employers may be looking for that teens can be working on while they're learning from home? Great question. Uh, you know, you mentioned LinkedIn, and <laughs> I have a very strict social media policy with my students. Like, you will never find me on social media after you graduate, but you can connect to me on LinkedIn, right? Um, and I think about uh, the limited amount of high school students who are actually on LinkedIn, which creates opportunity, right? You want to do what other people aren't doing, okay? And I think that uh, like creating your own website, but again, Having, that requires having a sense of what are my skills? What, what difference am I looking to make in the community? And how can I communicate that in a meaningful way? Having your own website, creating your own brand, um, and being able to engage in this way as we are today with uh, folks doing what you're doing, engaging with thought leadership. You know what, I think of, for example, in addition to LinkedIn, Twitter, there's so much incredible thought leadership that occurs on Twitter. Yeah, you can follow the celebrities too and post a meme or TikTok and all that great stuff too. You can, uh, but there's so much incredible thought leadership. And are you engaging and connecting and networking with people making the difference that you want to make, doing the work that you want to do, and connecting with them in a meaningful way. And I think there are opportunities via social media, LinkedIn being an option as well, where you can do that. But having a point of view and knowing what you bring to the table and what you're looking to achieve, I think that's really important. Yeah. You know, Damon, in your latest book, Power Shift, Seizing Opportunities, that's a lot of what you're talking about. What would you suggest that teens are doing right now to seize opportunities and, and make themselves marketable in this, in this environment? Yeah, absolutely. I think Brian hit it on the head uh, by going on LinkedIn. However, I think that all students and kids and people in general need to understand that 
all employers scan your social media uh, after you leave uh, the interview. And, uh, you know, you have to look at yourself as a brand. Can you put yourself in two to five words? Apple think different, Nike just do it, Fubu for us, buy us, whatever the case is, and make sure that message is out there. Because we're going to scan that. And if we see that uh, you are uh, somebody who's always talking negative and various other things that we don't agree with, we'll never tell you why we didn't call you for the job. We're also looking at the people you're taking pictures with, and we're trying to see what they about. On the flip side, if I see that you're always talking about charitable organizations, you're educating yourself both in school and outside of school, you want to change the planet. You're going to come to the, the job as a problem solver and bring uh, solutions that I want you, I desperately need you at the office. And by the way, 80% uh, of my staff all started as some form of an intern. Uh, because I realized if you're going to show up before the people I'm paying and stay after the people I'm paying and everybody <laughs> likes you and we want to be, be around you, I need to hire you. Can you please come work for me? So I think that it's, it's, it's really important right now to put your resume out in the world on social media the right way. And the bad things you got to do that you may not be proud of, you don't need to tell everybody. Yeah. You know, one thing I want to bring in, Dr. Klontz, if I can get your take on this, because we're talking about you know, identifying your destiny, seizing opportunities. What if you're at a stage where, first of all, there's so much that you want to do, you don't know where to start, or you just have no idea. You know, yeah, you're only 15 or 16 years old, and I say only, I know some of you are like, no, I want to be, you know, you and president, right? You know, be president or do something of a company. You know, you already know what you want to do, but there are a lot of people out there that aren't so sure, especially now. And um, how do you, what should you be thinking through? And what are some of the questions you need to ask yourself as you have that conversation with yourself about your destiny and what opportunities you might wanna seek? Yeah, first of all, if, if you know, we have this fantasy that everybody else has it all figured out, you know, that that other 15 year old, that other 20 year old's got it all lined out because they speak so eloquently and they're doing these really cool things. Look, not, none of us really have it figured out. Like, I'm not really sure what I'll be doing a year from now or two years from now. And so it's real easy to get frozen in this mindset where I have to figure it all out before I take a few steps. And unfortunately, people can spend decades in that spot. And so I strongly encourage you, you don't need to know exactly who you are and where you're going. You just need to move forward. Um, and a huge opportunity is building that brand on social media because that's something you can take with you wherever you go. And that's an asset that you could be putting time into building right now that will pay dividends the rest of your life. And you can always shift as you go. Like I've, I've had several different jobs and careers. Um, who knows what I'll be doing in a few more years. Don't let that stop you. Excellent, excellent advice. Um, you know, one of the things, shifting gears right now, thank you so much for your question. I really appreciate your question as well. One of the things that um, we've been spending a lot of time reporting on uh, during this pandemic is shortages. And we're talking about personal protective equipment, the shortages there, the shortages at grocery stores, the shortages of toilet paper, the shortages of so many things. And Damon, as a business owner, um, you're dealing with manufacturing supply issues all the time. We have a 18 year old, Casey Krell, who's in Junior Achievement uh, Young Ambassador Program. And with a question about product production and what you need to think about. Casey, what's your question? Hi, I'm so thankful to be here with you all today and have this opportunity. I'm a senior at Paradise Valley High School in Phoenix, Arizona, and I will be headed off to the University of Kansas in the fall to study broadcast journalism. So this is definitely a great way to get exposed to the field. Uh, my question for you is why do companies not produce more of products that are in higher demand? Uh Thank you, Casey. That's a great, great question. Um, but there's three different ways and or reasons why that uh, there could be shortages and or not as many products. There, uh, if it is a company that is selling a luxury item and they don't want everybody having it so you can feel special about it, Louis Vuitton, they will only make a limited amount. Uh, collectibles, whatever the case is. Then you have your traditional commodities, such as we're talking about toilet paper right now. Uh, we're in a, we're in a, uh, I need it immediately, uh, you know, generation and, uh, you know, normally these things do get up to speed after the demand, but they don't have just inventory sitting around because they're trying to operate a business and they're trying to move the goods and then order the amount of oil or materials prior. And it takes about 90 days to catch up to any production. 
And then, of course, you have people that don't have production shortages, such as technology. That's why a TikTok and or downloading music can uh, can can go globally in two days. So uh, it's really about demand, supply and demand. You never want to make more than you have a demand for um, because these goods could rot. They could, uh, you know, just sit in the warehouse, whatever the case is. So it's really because we're at a time when we all just need it today, right now, when we press a button. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. Um, Brian, there's a question about life after high school and career planning from Jonathan Martinez. He's 16 years old. He was selected in JA's 18 under 18 program because of his community involvement uh, teaching chess to kids. And he has a question about the process of selecting a college degree. Jonathan, what's your question? Hey, thanks for having me. I just wanted to know, are there college degrees that you would recommend uh, for high school students to look at more closely that weren't on your guys' radar before this crisis? And are there certain careers you feel will be negatively impacted by this crisis? Great question, Jonathan. I, in my role as a counselor, I, I don't uh, like to sort of uh, shift students in any direction when it comes to college degrees or things that they may study. I always come back to be your own unicorn. Like, what do you want to do? What are you passionate about? What are you interested in? And let's take that and carve that into a path for you in a meaningful way. Um, I think no matter which degree area students are looking at, I really think it's important at this stage to think about the relationship between that field or that content area and technology. I think we're seeing right now in very meaningful ways how a, an awareness of technology, not only in your own literacy, but in how it could influence or augment your work, your marketability, your ability, as Daniel was talking about, to pivot. I think that's very, very important. Um, so just having that awareness, um, because I do think there's so many uh, career areas and career clusters that are, have been negatively impacted um, by the pandemic and will continue to be, and some that have not yet been impacted that will be. Um, I think a lot of uh, any of the areas in which there is a, a physical relationship or physical work uh, directly with other people, a lot of the social uh, careers are heavily impacted, especially ones that require in-person um, uh, in person connection. I think about the arts. The arts have been impacted in a significant capacity recently. Um, but I think, though, that even if you, are, you do have an interest in any of these areas, uh, you can still create a path for yourself. It may not be what you thought it would be. I mean, when I studied sociology and theater at the undergraduate level, I had no idea that I would become a known high school counselor like 15 years later. I had no idea. But I think it's about um, being nimble, being flexible, and trying to be aware like, one step ahead. I think about there's a song from this movie, this is so cheesy, there's a song from the movie Frozen 2. Um, it's uh, the next right thing about, so how do you move forward in the wake of crisis. I love that song because it gives a model for how do you take the next step, the next breath? How are you focused in a short-term way that keeps you going, but aware of the larger implications in a way that moves uh, yourself and your community forward? I think that's going to be really important regardless of what field or degree area that students choose to tap into. Yeah. Sheila, what about you? What do you think in terms of the careers that will be negatively impacted by this crisis? Yeah, well, I, I think that was uh, was good advice, and and you you do need to be flexible and, and creative in approaching this. Um, you know, after the great financial crisis uh, ten years ago, over ten years ago now, we had a terrible recession that followed, and we saw majors in the humanities, liberal arts drop significantly uh, because students, as you might expect, in a recessionary period when jobs are tough, uh, they became more focused on majors where there was a clear career path. So uh, I, look, I think in any uh, major in college that you pick, you need to be aware of what your postgraduate earnings will likely be, especially if you're gonna take debt, you need to understand what your income producing potential will be. But I don't think you necessarily have to make compromises. I was a philosophy major at the University of Kansas, by the way, and I, I turned out all right. You know, I also used to be the president of Washington College. One of the things I saw there that we encouraged was combining degrees. So students would combine fine arts with chemistry. So, you know, those STEM majors typically may, may give you some more earnings potential. We're seeing a big uptick in computer science majors now, a lot of hiring. Everybody's gone digital, so I think that's going to be a growing field. But you, you can combine uh, the, the, you know, the science majors or the STEM majors with other fields, and that will make it more enriching. 
And I would also say for liberal arts, uh, that teaches you how to think, to communicate, to adapt, and those are always skills that will be useful throughout your career. And anybody, whether you're an engineer or a health professional or a business person or communications person, you need to be able to write and communicate. That is so hugely important, and that's also something that liberal arts uh, can provide. So I think be aware there and there are a lot more tools now the department of education now publishes uh, you know degrees by college what the average income is after those students graduate how much debt they had to take on again that's the bit of information to consider uh, but i think if you know if your heart's really sad on french literature or whatever you can find probably creative ways to combine that with other fields to make yourself employable uh, when you graduate but also something that you'll find fulfilling Sheila, you should see the liberal arts majors like cheering over here. I have a sociology <laughs> undergrad degree, so did Brian. We're like, yes, so, you know, liberal arts, liberal arts. So thank you very much. It is it is important also practically to go to those calculators, to go to that site, check out what you what the what the possible salaries are, but also to do what you're passionate about and combine it. I never expected as a sociology major to be a financial news correspondent ever. Right. So, right. um, you know, X10 was not my best course back then, but now I love economics. So you never know, you never know. Brad, I wanna ask you a question, um, or if you can help Claire Lewis with her question about saving, investing, and spending. She has a spending question in particular. She's 16 years old and from New York State. Claire, what's your question? Hi, um, when it becomes safe to return to normal life, is it more likely that there will be a splurge in spending or will people be more cautious with their budget? Great question, Claire. I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I'm already, I've got some pent up demand inside of me. Like I really would like to go out to eat. I'd love to go to the mall. I got to catch a movie. And I think what we're going to see is we are going to see um, a, an uptick in spending, especially initially. Um, but you know, many other people are going to be much more cautious and and brian brought up a term earlier that's really important here and he used the word trauma and people are being traumatized by this there's there's a lot of fear a lot of uncertainty a lot of hardship that we're experiencing and this isn't the first time this has happened and we have we have research on this they're, they're, the great depression generation for example were so traumatized by that that scarcity and not having enough that it changed their entire relationship with money the rest of their lives and they were they were intense savers and hoarders and sometimes couldn't even enjoy life because they had so much fear about not having enough and, and i think a lot of us are going through that right now um and it can create a scarcity mindset which can be really problematic um and actually that scarcity mindset where there's not enough and i need to get mine and that that actually is associated with terrible like outcomes in your financial life People don't want to work with you with that mindset. They want an abundance mindset. They want a giving mindset. They want um, that sort of mindset. So post-traumatic growth is really critical for this. And this is where we're taking something bad and we're trying to mine it for all the good things that we can actually be better off for at the other end. And so there is the opportunity. Um, we have talked about this before. Before the pandemic, 75% of Americans were living paycheck to paycheck. Now that that's that's sort of amazing, um, and many people didn't have an emergency fund. And if you hadn't haven't heard of an emergency fund, it's it's saving up three to six months of income for something like this. Um, and most financial advisors will strongly suggest you have one. This is a great example of of people can be on the other side of this with much better financial health because now they realize, okay, I needed to do that, um, and so they take it as a life lesson. Um, and so there's lots of opportunities here for many of us to improve our financial life once we get through the pain associated with what's happening. Excellent, Brad, thank you so much. I have a question now that um, I wanna bring in Banks McGlowhorn because he's from South Carolina, he's 13 years old, and he has a question about what he can do to help small businesses. Damon, we've talked a lot about small businesses, but Banks has a unique question. Banks, what's your question? Hey, thank you so much for having me. Around me, I've seen a lot of small businesses shutting down or hesitating to reopen or just open in general. So my question to you is that considering all the impact that the pandemic has had on the small businesses, what do you think could be done to encourage entrepreneurs to start new businesses in future without fear that their business could be wiped out due to potential pandemics or even economic shutdowns? Uh, that's more probably going to be more of an education and a government thing where they give incentives to open uh, new businesses. I mean, you know, the 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 thought process of opening a new business is uh, a very independent you know and or specific need you know some way they say 
when you're an entrepreneur, you work 80 hours to avoid working 40. Um, and some people are going to want to feel like they can go back to their companies. But now, as we see what happens, a lot of people feel that they're not in charge of their destiny. They're working on somebody else's dream instead of their own. So first of all, it's going to need to be about education because the whole theory of you need money to make money and you got to borrow all this and that, that's absolutely wrong. Um, one of the uh, top reasons why small businesses fail is actually overfunding. They go out and borrow too much and they haven't sold in that one piece of the product yet and or they didn't create uh, a community of people who want to buy their product so i think at first it's an education standpoint we have to start there and then there's some incentives to uh to educate people on why business is good for them to open up for entrepreneurs or if you know they should reconsider and go and work on uh you know somebody else's business uh I do have to say that every batman like i consider myself batman and my team is robin but often my team is Batman and I'm Robin. Every entrepreneur needs people around them. Also, it is a team sport. So just like when we see an athlete on the on the on the court or on the field, that athlete has an agent, a, an attorney, uh, uh, you know, uh, a nutritionist and everything else. So I say all that to say there's ways to work with an entrepreneurial mindset with other entrepreneurs and flourish at the same time. So you just really have to look at your options. And I know I'm a little all over the place, but I'm trying to give you various different ways to frame whether you want to open up a small business again or work with somebody else to help them. Dan, I think that's a great point because also, as you pointed out, so many small businesses are actually independent businesses, one person businesses. And but it's not really one person. It can't survive with just that one person. There has to be a team in some way behind that, but behind that entrepreneur, right? Yeah, absolutely. So whether you are a hairdresser, you need to go to a salon and they rent you a chair or you also need an accountant, right? Most likely. And you may need uh, you may need banks to handle your social media and take great content and put it out there of all the beautiful hairstyles you don't whatever the case may be. But yes, uh, being an entrepreneur is a team sport. Yeah, absolutely. So we have time for one last question, and I want to send this question to you, Jack Kowalski. I want to come back to you and, and find out what you would say to Simone Washington from Orlando. She's 17 years old, and she wants to know, should schools offer financial literacy classes to prepare young adults for situations like these so that they're better equipped to handle the unexpected when they become adults? Well, Simone, that's a great question. And based on the entire conversation we've had this morning or this afternoon, clearly schools do need to offer it. It's a, it's a little bit of a tough question though, because right now, 21 of the states do require some form of personal finance uh, classes while students are in high school. And in those 21 states, research has shown that those students do a better job of uh, selecting colleges, the financial part that ties in with it. So clearly we do. The one place I think as a society we need to be careful is that we ask our schools to do a lot. And there are these unfunded mandates that come in and so it makes it much more difficult. But in general, every student that graduates from school, no matter what they do, are going to have to learn how to manage money. And our research shows that the number one person that they go to tends to be their parents. And unfortunately, parents feel ill-equipped to do that. Uh, one last plug I'll put in, I heard so much about choosing colleges today. Uh, Junior Achievement has an app, it's free. It's called JA Build Your Future. You get it through either one of the, the major stores and it helps parents and students actually walk through the business side of selecting a college. So I would really encourage those that are, are listening to take a look at that app. Jack Kosakowski, thank you. Thank you for your leadership with Junior Achievement. Thank you for having the wonderful idea to bring us all together today. And thank you for sharing that app because again, as I told the students, they've got to share this information and put it out there. That's something that you can definitely include in the in the tweets that you're going to put out and what you're putting out on Instagram after, after this virtual town hall. You know, Junior Achievement does so much good. And one of the things that has inspired me is just the words that you had on your website. While today is uncertain, tomorrow represents hope and dreams. Hope is so important at this time. And I hope that a lot of you have been inspired by what you've heard from other students and what you've heard from our wonderful panel of experts. 
Thank you to Sheila Bear, Brian Coleman, Brad Klontz, Damon John. You've been so generous with your time. You've answered these questions so honestly and so thoroughly. I know that everyone has gained a lot of information from this session. And if you want to watch some clips about today's event, if you want to share some clips from today's event, then go to cnbc.com slash invest in you. And if you want to learn more about some of the topics that we've been talking about, about how to manage and grow and protect your money, I urge you to sign up for our Money 101 newsletters. Go to cnbc.com slash money 101. Again, another website that you can share with your friends. All of you are going to be so successful. I'm going to wish you continued success, but I know that it's a given because you have hope and you have dreams and you're inspiring all of us by what you're doing. So please know we're all in this together and I am so honored to be in it with all of you. Have a great day.